Uh, I am not the normal person for those of you who are regular here. My name is Justin Elwell. Uh, but some of you might be here for the very first time. And uh, I want to talk to you just for a minute. First of all, I want to say welcome. You do not see a difference. As a matter of fact, when you walked in and I came up, you thought it was just normal. Uh, This is a guy who I got to listen to for the next hour and a half. And uh, first of all, I want to give you great news. It's only an hour 15. Um, Secondly, I want to say, although we're beginning a new series, uh, there is a speaker that is going to be speaking next week that is going to do an even better job than you've heard today. As a matter of fact, if I had a choice between coming this week and next week, I would be at next week's uh, service. And so you're already here, so you might as well just stick it out anyway. Uh, but if, if you had a choice go here next week. Now, I also want to make mention of this that maybe not everybody knows, uh, but the pastor of CDO Bible Church tomorrow is celebrating an anniversary. And a little birdie told me that. And so I thought it would be a great to just give him a, a, how many years, by the way? 35 years. Let's give them a hand. Celebrating 35th anniversary. Uh, what an awesome thing. And they got, a, they got an early birthday present. A second grandbaby was born yesterday. I'm sure there's pictures somewhere, but they might not be up yet. They joked a lot about it. Uh, I'm sure you'll see hear all about that next week. Uh, but it was a great thing that they took their anniversary month to kind of teach on marriage. Now, most people, when they think of June, they don't think, oh, that's the anniversary month of the pastor. June has kind of gotten hijacked, and there's been a whole different thing that's been talked about. It seems like every corporation has changed their logo colors. Every every, uh, uh, sign that you see as you walk into a store look a a lot more like uh, Noah's Day. Um, A lot of things have changed uh, in our in our world this month as we celebrate as a society something that God called an abomination. And I, I find that there's something a little worse than that, a little more troubling than that, that problem because a lot of us, you know, talk about that and we'll, we'll yell and we'll fight about it and we'll yell at the TV and everything like that all month long. But there's something more troubling than that. Something more troubling than just the fact that, you know, two people like each other that probably shouldn't that way. And that is that our nation is dealing with a slow destruction of the oldest institution this world has ever had. The institution of marriage. See, see, long before God ever started society or civil government, long before God ever started uh, uh, the, the family dynamic, before God uh, ever started the church or, or, or the temple, God started with one man and one woman getting together in community. And can I just tell you, the only reason why God started with one man and one woman getting into community is because there were only two people. So when you come to church, don't let it just be two people. More people should come into community. God realized from the very infancy of the world that people needed to be together, not split apart. People needed to come together, not be isolated in their own little world and their most likely device, uh, living separate from a community. But at the very start, we see it was just one man, one woman. But we're living in a world in which the longest lasting institution of our world's under attack. Marriage expectations are changing, especially among Gen Z and millennials. uh, A recent survey from the Thriving Center of Psychology said that two in five people, or 40% of the Gen Z and millennials surveyed, stated they believe marriage to be an outdated tradition. 
While the, and this is of course millennials and Gen Z, so it'll help you out. While they believe it's an outdated tradition, 83% of those surveyed believe that they would one day get married. So they don't know what to think about this thing called marriage. It's, they just don't see it as applicable, as necessary in their daily life. But there's something, and one of the big reasons that they gave was just the economics of marriage. It's so much more expensive to be married now. You got to buy the house, and of course, you got to have a bigger house than you can afford, and a bigger car than you can drive, and, and, uh, but it's got to be eco-friendly, which means more in batteries, and, and all of this stuff. And they say, I can't afford to have this, this historic institution that God brought into our world to exist. Now let's bring it down into our area, Tucson. Tucson is the 15th most populous city of these types of people. It's couples who are living together but not married. We rank 15th in the list of large cities. So what does that tell us? That tells us that a lot of people like the idea of pairing up just without commitment and definitely not a promise to God. Thing is, God is, from the very beginning, saw a need for this institution. Let's talk a little bit about the title, The Blueprint for Marriage. I had an opportunity yesterday to talk to one guy, uh, he's probably in the service, who at least said he went to architect school. He didn't actually tell me he was an architect, so hopefully that's what he actually used his education. But he, he was an architect, and so he would be very familiar with this, but most of us would. Uh, a blueprint is, is something that a designer of a building has a vision of what he expects a building to look like. And so usually he hires in an architect or that architect himself is a designer of the building and they start to draw up all the plans of the expectation of how that building is supposed to be constructed. After they get that blueprint, they deliver it to a builder. And that builder's job is not to do what he wants to with the blueprints, not to just say, well, I like it better over here and I like this over here. No, it is the builder's job. The whole reason that builder exists at that moment is to build exactly what the blueprint specified. Guess what? This thing called marriage had a designer. The designer was God. And God had a specific way that he built or, or, or he envisioned that this idea of marriage was going to be. And so he used an architect. He used holy men of old as they were moved by the Spirit of God to pin exactly what he was envisioning the marriage to be. And he put it in this thing that we get to carry around called the Scriptures. This is the blueprints from the designer. Now, why do you have the scriptures? You're the builder. Your job is to take the blueprint and build what the designer envisioned. So, God designed marriage? Yes. Well, what's he want it to be? I am so glad you asked. You probably didn't even realize you asked. We're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can head that way. If you'd rather use the screens, a lot of the verses that we read from are going to be found uh, in, uh, on the screens. And if you're listening at home, I want to thank you for participating in the service and uh, being a part of everything that's going on. But 
There's three areas that I believe Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 where God kind of informs us about what and why He created this thing called marriage. Number one, the reason He instituted marriage was because it demonstrates a relationship with the divine. It is a picture. See, we read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, let us make man, this is actually God talking, uh, I guess you could say to himself, but it's actually the Godhead, the Trinity, uh, that is speaking among themselves. We know him as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But anyway, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, which that's birds aren't there, uh, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He says, this is, he's going to have a mission, a passion, and, and there's something going to be very significant about man and woman. Then he says, so God created man in his own image, and image God created he him, male and female created he them. See, God understood that in the diversity of his Godhead, three persons, one in being, in the diversity of his Godhead, he also understood that relationship among him, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, was very crucial to their identity. You can't have God without the Father. You can't have God without the Son. You can't have God without the Holy Spirit. And so when he created something in his image after his likeness, he said, I must create something that has some diversity. That's why when you men say, man, my wife thinks completely different than me. That was designed that way. So he brought his, so he created man and woman. And now what was supposed to happen between that man and woman? This male and female. Well, what was supposed to happen was the male and the female were supposed to figure out a way to come together, just like God is together. So it started a process. Now, Paul explains this passage very well in Ephesians. He actually utilizes some of the words from, from uh, Genesis chapter 2 when he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says this. He says, this mystery is profound. It's like, oh, that doesn't sound profound. I hear that in every wedding ceremony. Uh, I know this, this concept. And he said, but here's what the profound thing is. I'm not talking about a wedding. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm actually talking about God or Christ in the church. He said the, the responsibilities and roles of the man and the woman in the relationship has a direct correlation and expectation that the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you and you should have with God. He said, I want a good example that I can spread across the world of how I want us to interact. I want people to see your marriage and say, is that how God wants me to be? Now, ladies, you represent the church. You represent that, that entity that is being refined, that is being with the irons, ironing out the wrinkles, as it says a few verses before. You're being adorned, ready for the wedding ceremony. Men, you have a much higher responsibility to live up to. You represent God. You say, well, that's not hard. Oh, yes, it is. Because God loves his bride, whether she's adorned or not. 
Matter of fact, God loves his bride, whether she hates him or not. I'll take it a step further. God loves his bride if she is defiant or not, because it was never obedience followed love. It was always before we even knew him, Christ loved us. In other words, you don't love your wife because she's worthy of your love. You love your wife because God commanded you to. You're the initial, react, initial action. So why did God do this? He did it because he wanted a real world visual example of this relationship because God loves you so much. He, he loved you enough to run to the cross just so you would appreciate Him. Just so you could be saved. Just so you could be rescued from the grips of depravity. He loves you. That's the first thing. I got to hurry to the second one. Although I heard I can preach longer in second service. No, just kidding. What's the next reason that God instituted marriage? Well, I'm not going to talk about you guys for this next one, okay? I'm not going to talk about you personally. I'm going to tell you what Adam needed and what Eve needed. I'm not going to say what you need, okay? Because maybe you need different things in your relationship. I'm just talking about Adam and Eve, okay? So you can rest easy if you feel like, well, this, I, I don't need that out of a man or I don't need that out of a woman. I'm just talking about them. If it's applicable to you, after you hear it, maybe, maybe it works. Adam needed companionship. Eve needed purpose. Adam needed companionship Eve needed purpose. Let me set the scene in Genesis chapter 2. <sighs> in one breath, a formed shell of dirt that God had formed all of a sudden became animated as God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And it wasn't just a physical animation of, oh, this, this person became skin and everything like that. No, it was so much more than that. The Bible actually indicates that man became a living soul. Something more powerful. Something, uh, uh, and, and, and we see throughout all of Scripture that this soul that God gave to man is a never extinguishing soul. This soul never ceases to exist. This soul will go on forever. The Adam's soul is still as alive as it was when man breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You're like, wait a second, Adam died. I read it later on when I was trying to skim through the genealogies. No, the word death literally means separation. His body was separated from his soul. So while his body, the shell, ceased to exist, the soul continued on. And that soul continued on in one of two places, the Bible indicates. And your soul will live on, just like his soul lived on. Here's the question. Do you know where your soul is going? My preacher, I don't even know what my soul is. I'll try and explain it to you. Hope you got that definition. The soul is the part of you that's you. The soul is the part of you that's thinking. The part of you that gives you your personality. It is the real you. It is the, uh, that, that recognizes that you exist. That's your soul. And that soul's going somewhere. Said so, preacher, I don't know where that soul's going. 
you have come to the right place. Maybe reach out to somebody, maybe someone sitting beside you that shook your hand earlier and said, I don't know where my soul is going after the service or, or come up to uh, uh, Pastor Steve or myself after the service and say, I don't know where my soul's going, can you show me? We would love to take the Bible and show you because you can walk out of the doors today knowing exactly where your soul is going when you die. Today. Well, when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, man became this living soul. He had all the potential in the world, but he didn't know much, kind of like men today. And so uh, 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 God recognized something early on. He, it seemed to indicate that man knew communication. He knew some physical abilities like walking and talking and, and moving around. So God, the first thing he did is he, he created a garden in Eden, this garden of Eden that's talked about, surrounded by four waters. And he placed Adam in this garden to protect it and to nurture it, to, to cultivate it. To, uh, uh, the, the words that I use uh, from a translation is to dress and to keep it. Uh, but he took this g- garden and God gave a purpose purpose to man, he stuck him in there and he said, take care of this and protect it. That was his purpose. But God recognized something early on as he stuck man in the garden as he said, you know, it's not good that man's alone. I need to give him a good helper. He needs a helper. And I love how God does this. Love how God does this. He did not give Adam something Adam didn't want or didn't need. Rather, he waited for Adam to figure out he needed something. So the first thing God does is he starts to bring animals to Adam. Now, when you think about that and you've read the little storybooks, you're like, oh, yeah, Adam got to name the animals. Oh, yay, that's all it was. No, you didn't understand. This was a beauty contest. Pretty much Adam was bringing, or God was bringing these animals to Adam. Adam was naming them. And, and uh, you know, and this is, by the way, why we know a dog is not man's best friend. He had that option. He said no. Uh, he saw the dog. He said, cute, but not, not, mate, not mating material. And the Bible says that Adam named all these animals. And then it uses this key phrase. He says, but there was not found a good helper for Adam. So after Adam saw the animal kingdom, he said, none of this works. None of this works. And when Adam saw his need for a companion, the Bible says God put him in a deep sleep and he removed a rib. Guys, your dust balls, girls, your ribs. That's what that's it. Just the simple truth is. He takes this rib, and the Bible says he uses that rib to form and shape and make a woman. And then he brought this woman to the man. Now we know Adam definitely needed a companion, but why do we think, why would, we, why would you say that This woman's purpose was Adam. Eve's purpose was Adam. Well, just like God put man in the garden and said, dress it and keep it, he put woman beside the man. Well, for what reason? Well, the same reason God put Adam in the garden. Eve needed to dress and keep Adam. So how do you know that, preacher? Why did God use a rib? I've heard lots of preachers who preach about different things, you know. He didn't use a foot bone because the woman's not under her head bone, that woman's above, you know, that great stuff. Love it all. But I started to research, well, what's a rib for? What's the function of a rib? Well, the exclusive function of a rib is it's a hard bone that protects vital organs. Most specifically, the heart and the lungs. So what did God do? Well, God, in forming this woman, wanted to remind Adam, and by extension, the rest of us men, 
that I am, you are becoming vulnerable. I am removing a safety net from you and you are now being left exposed. And I'm going to create a woman that is going to be able to protect your vulnerabilities. And by the way, ladies, it is your purpose in the marriage relationship to protect your man. And men, it is your responsibility to protect her world. Nothing can bring a man to question his entire life existence than his wife attacking him. Nothing flies in the face of, uh, makes him question so much than to have his wife demean him. Why? Because God created woman with unique power. You say, do I really have unique power? Let me give you an illustration. Do you know there's two ways that you can get your husband to take out the trash? You ladies know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just putting the words what you know in your mind. The first way is, you say, why do you never take out the trash? It is time to take out the trash. I told you over and over and over again, and you're still sitting there watching football. It's not even football season. You're watching the reruns on ESPN+. Plus. Your husband's like, fine. And you go over there and you take out the trash. Really, you're just going to take out the trash so you can get a few minutes of peace. It works. You're not really protecting his heart. But oh, there's another way. I learned this way from my wife. See, I discovered that I was He-Man. I remember her coming up to me. She said, hey, babe. I'm like, yeah. It's like, I am so weak. And you are so so strong. Can you use those big, strong muscles to take out this trash for me? I'll take out two. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get some extra reps in. And uh, wh why? Why was that so much different? Why were you giggling as I was saying it? Because you understand, ladies, especially the power of your words. You understand that you can give life and you can take that life away. You can make your man feel like he's king of the world when he walks out to work, or you can make him feel like the most inferior person in the world because you have the woman's intuition. You, have, you can feel the, 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 the pressure of life uh, uh, on your husband. God has gifted you with some amazing qualities, and when you focus that on the relationship, you create what you ultimately want. And men, you'd probably like that, huh? Like, this is good stuff. Where did you get this from? God's blueprint. God's blueprint. When he brought the woman to the man, protect that man. Dress him. Keep him. And some of you older couples understand sometimes that means literally dress him. He never matches. Then there's a third reason. Why did God institute this thing called marriage? It allows man to establish a distinct separation and assume a new leadership role. And allows ladies to be sought after, protected, treasured, and entangled in love. In this passage, Genesis chapter 2, what God did in Genesis chapter 1 is pretty much just stated facts and said, this is how it happened, believe it. But in Genesis chapter 2, he starts to elaborate on the story that was found in Genesis chapter 1. He said, I created male and female. That's how it happened. But he goes to Genesis chapter 2 and explains the process. And then he gets to this verse at the very, or, or second to the last verse, he says, therefore. Now, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, what you have to do is you have to read the preceding verses to find out what the next sentence is there for. That'll just help you as you're studying. So he says, he pretty much says, now I'm going to give you the moral of the story. 
the why I wrote this, why I decided to elongate this story and show you some crucial things. The reason why I did that is because I'm going to give you now the general sense, not just what Adam needed or Eve needed or, or what I expected from this thing, but now I'm going to talk about all men and all uh, uh, mankind and, and what this institution is here for. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. See, for men, the reason why this idea of marriage was kind of given for the future generations is it was going to give a very um, uh, natural way for a man to leave being the son of his father and mother in obedience to establish himself as a new family, a new family line, a new family expectation in the societal structure that was about to be created. So the whole idea is that that man would say, okay, I've officially reached manhood. I am no longer in the, in the obedience role of children, Ephesians chapter 6, and now I am graduating into establishing my own leadership role as I come into adulthood. And so he leaves father and mother, and, and he creates, in essence, a new family. Ladies, this is what's cool. Because he doesn't just leave. It's not just like I'm leaving because I want to break all the rules and I want to rebel. No, no, that wasn't why he left. The reason why, and God kind of put this in the heart of man, the reason why he's no longer mama's boy is because he found a new prize. He wasn't just leaving, he was cleaving, he was holding fast Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall hold fast to his wife. Ladies, this is the coolest thing. God wants you to feel treasured, valued, entangled in love. So much so where your identities are no longer, well, I'm, uh, uh, I'm my own man. And, and I'm my own woman, but so entangled in love that I don't know what to do without my bride. I don't know what to do without my husband. We're, we're so entangled in this relationship. It's like we're the same. It's like I'm missing a part of me. And ladies, God wants you that valued. And men, do that. Value your, the prize. Don't fall victim to something on the internet that keeps you from valuing the prize. Don't run off on a, on a business trip and, and take, take hold of nothing instead of keeping yourself value, valuing the prize. She is your treasure. She's what you'd leave your family for. You'd literally start a new identity just so you can protect her, just so you can value her, just so you can love her. And if that does not speak to your relationship right now, change it. And be in a relationship God designed it to be. Let me give you just some quick closing application thoughts. Number one, our success in the God-ordained institution of marriage is contingent on our commitment to the scriptural principles of marriage, or to put it simply, do marriage God's way. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. Do what God tells you to do. He gave you the blueprint. Read it. Say, we're going to reset up some stuff. Number two, this one's important. Allow the yearnings of your spouse's needs to be fulfilled. I remember a conversation I had about a 10 or 11 years into our relationship. My wife and I, we were kind of in that zone where it's not that it was bad, it's not that it was great, it was just eh. And so I remember one time we were, we were taking a trip, a long trip with the family, and so we either put on a video or put on some music and kind of pushed it more to the back of the minivan and had the kids listening to stuff and 
I looked over at her and I started a conversation that was simply this. What am I, am I doing something that is making this relationship this way? This was the hardest thing I'd ever done. Because, I mean, when you're married, you're not actually supposed to talk to them. (sighs) I mean, like, really talk to them. You're not, like, supposed to have a serious conversation and really talk about your relationship. I mean, that's what a therapist is for. But I just, I just kind of made it. It's like, am I doing something wrong? And it really wasn't, uh, well, I've got a list for you. And so when you ask the question, man, I'm like, points. But I really just was noticing our relationship wasn't great. And so we talked about it. We started asking questions. Am I not doing something that you have an expectation of how our marriage is supposed to be? Or, and, and she responded. And that started a conversation, hour and a half, two hours, that I still think about seven years later. We're at different times, we were crying and snotty nose while I'm driving. It wasn't very safe. <laughs> but boy, was it good. Because we actually were able to open up about that next level of yearnings that we were dealing with. Husband, wife, take some time. You, you see an issue, don't let it linger to the point to where divorce becomes the first time you ever hear there's a problem. Start way back when on saying, I, we just don't feel connected. What do we need to do? It's a beautiful conversation, fulfilling each other's needs. And then lastly, and I'll be done, be a threefold cord. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, the Bible talks about this, and he, he, he talks about this idea that the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, Ecclesiastes, most depressing book you'll ever read. But there's some gems in there, and one of those gems that this man named Solomon said was two are better than one. And he goes on to defend his answer, you know, if it's a lot better if two people are, you know, laying in bed asleep because it provides warmth, but if one person's all alone, they get cold. You ladies know something about that. Um, uh, you know, it's better for work. It's better for a lot of things to have more than one. And he's not just referring specifically to a marriage. He's referring to community and companionship and such like that. But marriage is a very applicable part. But he, but he ends in that passage there in Ecclesiastes. He said, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Now, when we talk about a marriage, of course we understand the husband, we understand the wife, but God's not advocating polygamy here. What he's saying is he's saying there needs to be something that these two cords entwine around to create the strength. Maybe a stronger cord so it can make the whole stronger, uh, but there needs to be something they can truly wrap around. Because I've always discovered relationships work best when the woman doesn't try and be like her husband and the husband doesn't try and be like her uh, uh, woman. And and they keep some identity points that are who they are, but maybe they find their unity and they find their oneness in wrapping around the same thing. Well, if that's true, if it's better to have a threefold cord and you got one man, one woman, what do you think the third cord needs to be? God. Wrap yourself around the strong force. God brings people together. He doesn't separate them. He's the one who brings that unity that is so strong, which is why you are not going to have a happy marriage because you showed up to a marriage seminar one time. You're going to have the God-ordained marriage that he wants you to have, which is the most fulfilling marriage you can have, by connecting to him. Husbands, you will be a better husband as you draw closer to God. Ladies, you will be a better wife as you draw closer to God. And then there's people here who say, well, my husband died. This isn't much for me. You can still be, wrap yourself around the cord. Get close to Jesus. You might be a single person here and said, I have no interest in marriage. Why did I even show up this month? I'll tell you why you showed up. Because the same Paul that told us about the husband and wife responsibilities and how it represents Christ's church is the same Paul who said, you know, I would wish that everybody were like me and weren't encumbered with a wife. 
gives me, it gives, why? Why did he say that? Because it gives me the ability to go all out for God and not have anything constraining me. So if you're sitting here and God called you to be single, then you be single and draw close to the Lord. If God called you to be married, then both of you wrap yourself around the Lord. Make your whole identity of your marriage be, it is built on the purpose of what God wants me to be and wants us to be. And it is in that season and in that opportunity that you will find the blessing of the institution of marriage or the institution of singlehood being carried out into something beautiful that God had ordained from the beginning. Father, thank you so much for what we have heard. Thank you so much for you being such a good God to us. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for showing us just what it means to be loved and valued. Lord, we're unworthy. We don't deserve that. We can never ask for that. But Lord, you have chosen to rescue us anyway. So Lord, I pray that as we search our hearts during this time of worship, Maybe here, the Holy Spirit start to customize these words, the words of Scripture, into our hearts. Lord, that we can walk out of here as married couples in better marriages, and singles in a closer relationship with you, and all of us praising you. In Jesus' name, amen.